Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. There is a reason why I haven't touched upon certain subjects on this channel, sometimes because I haven't believed certain popular alternative hypotheses, sometimes I was afraid of putting out an unpopular opinion, which now in hindsight is somewhat silly, and sometimes I am still on the fence. On this channel I happily read the comments in the comments section, I listen to the points of view of others, even if it differs from my own, and I have been shown evidence that counters some points I've made in videos, and therefore I have grown and developed because of the discussions around topics I've covered. So for that, thank you. And that brings me to the subject of this video. The Baghdad Battery, also known as the Batteries of Babylon, which many of you will have heard of, and although some will have looked into the subject in detail, others will be like I used to be, and will have just blindly accepted the hypothesis that this is an ancient battery. All because of a popular hypothesis, some convincing arguments and clear diagrams. I've never doubted that the Baghdad battery wasn't an electrical device, but this was until I researched the subject over a year ago, and found that there are in fact a number of problems with the idea, problems that researchers fail to explain. Since then I've been sat on the fence, but I've actually been swayed more towards the idea that this isn't an ancient battery. Now, many of you will watch this video, and many of you will disagree with some of the points made, some will be saying that I've gone mainstream or something like that, but I've not turned mainstream and I'm also not alternative. I'm just a researcher who looks at evidence and uses his own mind. When I mention certain pieces of scientific evidence that back up a mainstream view, such as carbon dating, which I know has its flaws, I always receive multiple comments that say science is corrupt, and this process is flawed and can't be trusted. Yet, when I make a video and say Gebekli Tepe is 12,000 years old, all because it's been proved by carbon dating, I don't receive any such comments, which I always find quite strange. Another example is the Younger Dryas event. Now that mainstream science is accepting that this was likely caused by an impact event, does it now mean we shouldn't trust it, and actually say it's all lies, and that an impact event did not happen? How can we trust it? When I recently said that science proves that Antarctica could not have been ice free in the past few million years, all because of ice core data and other geological evidence, I got those same comments saying mainstream science can't be trusted, and it's all corrupt. But again, those same people believe the mainstream science when it supports an alternative theory like the Younger Dryas impact event, which relies on similar ice core data in geology. So, my point is this. Unless we are experts in a certain field, it seems unfair to blindly criticise the science, history or archaeology. We have to prove the point and find the evidence if we disagree. Either that, or we also need to apply the same level of scepticism when science supports a popular alternative theory. I look at the evidence and the data, the science, the history and the archaeology, but I try to find the anomalies and have a go at interpreting things myself, based on the facts as well as the opinions of experts in their fields. I base my belief that a large number of structures at Giza in Egypt do predate the 4th dynasty because of the unexplainable archaeological anomalies, as well as the geological evidence. I believe that man-made geopolymer stone was used, at least in part, to case the Bent Pyramid because of the geological analysis of the stone. But I don't believe the Antarctic geologists and climatologists are wrong, simply because some old maps that the authors themselves generally explain are hypothetical. Sorry to go on, but that brings us back to the subject of this video, the Baghdad Battery, a so-called out-of-place artefact. The story begins in 1930, when Austrian archaeologist Wilhelm Koenig took part in a German archaeological expedition in modern-day Iraq, which he eventually went on to direct. Eight years later, and he was working for the museum in Baghdad, and he was excavating a Parthian site at Kujut Rubu. Apologies if I pronounced that wrong. It was during this excavation where he discovered a 15 cm high ceramic vessel. From the outside it was somewhat ordinary, nothing special, but he found that it contained a cylinder of sheet copper, and it was soldered with a lead tin alloy of a ratio of 60-40. 
The vessel was capped with a crimped-in copper-shaped disc and it was sealed with either bitumen or asphalt, with another insulating layer of asphalt on top. This held in place an iron rod which was suspended in the centre of the cylinder and showed signs of acid corrosion. So, from this description, you can certainly see how the battery hypothesis came about. The archaeologist identified it as an ancient electrical battery, and replicas were made that showed it was capable of providing a charge of about 1 volt, when used with vinegar or lemon juice as an electrolyte. Even more examples of this battery were found in Iraq, all dating to the Parthian period between the mid-3rd century BC and the early 3rd century AD. It seemed that these discoveries could rewrite the history of the development of electricity and it seemed clear that we finally had proof of sophisticated ancient technology. But remember, these artefacts are not evidence of some advanced lost civilization way back in remote antiquity, the artefacts are contemporary with the somewhat advanced Roman Empire who you would think would have surely known about any advanced technology that was developed by the Parthian Empire, which was Rome's main enemy in the east. Koenig, a mainstream respected archaeologist, did once believe that these vessels were batteries. But, over the years, and with further research, the hypothesis is no longer accepted and I'll explain why. Although a number of these items have been found, no electric motors, circuitry, wires, or any other device that would require electrical power has ever been discovered. It's only worth developing a battery if you have something to power. And although the archaeological record is not complete, you would expect something to have been discovered by now, especially because a few of these batteries have been found. But even if they were batteries, they would be highly inefficient with poor performance. What can 1 volt power? Furthermore, the asphalt seal is a complete seal, not removable and not partial, and it even covered the small part of the iron rod that poked out the top and so there will be no way of obtaining any electricity that has been generated from within the pot. The contents of the vessel were contained, which really doesn't make sense if their sole purpose was to make electricity. A bitumen or asphalt seal is an extremely inconvenient material to use to seal an ancient battery, which, if this was its function, would require frequent topping up of the electrolyte. The most likely interpretation is actually somewhat mundane, that they were in fact storage vessels for sacred papyri, due to their similarity to objects found in Seleucia. Of course, it's a subject we can debate, and I don't think it's at all clear cut, but if you want to believe they are batteries, I have to ask, what did they power? What required the tiny amount of electricity? If you think that more than one vessel was joined together, then how? And if so, why didn't they just make larger vessels for a greater voltage? And also, how did they get the electricity out of a sealed vessel? Because there is evidence the iron rod was completely covered over with asphalt. And how did they replace the electrolyte? Because there is no evidence they were ever opened after being made. These are the problems with the battery hypothesis, and are points that need to be countered logically and scientifically if the battery hypothesis remains on the table. Maybe they didn't hold ancient sacred scrolls, and maybe they weren't batteries. So, what else could they be? Some think they were used for electroplating or even electrotherapy, but no electroplated objects are known in this region from this time period. It seems likely they were made to hold scrolls, but then, why the metal components? And tests show that they could generate a low voltage. Is this just pure luck? They are somewhat of a mystery, so please do leave your thoughts in the comments section below. The story of the Baghdad batteries ends on a somewhat sad note, because among the objects looted from the Iraqi National Museum in Baghdad during the invasion by US and Allied forces in 2003 were these precious and unique objects. 17 years later, and it is not known where they are now, whether they are in someone's private collection, or whether they have in fact been destroyed. It is a sad story when it ends like this, when precious, unique artefacts go missing, and will likely never be recovered. 
The last words of this video go to Professor Elizabeth Stone of Stony Brook University, an expert on Iraqi archaeology, because she said in 2012 on record that she does not know a single archaeologist who believed that these were batteries. Which, you have to say, does seem quite compelling. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.